and then your own individual creative practice that uh, they balance each other out in a way. But if you remove one, you almost lose the impetus for the other because you don't. Yeah, I I really feel that um, because I almost use like my personal art as like not an escape, but I mean, my corporate job, I wasn't designing things that I necessarily wanted to be. I mean, who is in their normal day job? So I, I use like the morning right before I started work. And then like usually the evenings after work when I was just like stressed with, you know, people don't know how to open a PDF in, uh, in Acrobat. And I was like, no. <laughs> and so I would just do something for myself. And, and then, you know, that's kind of became my thing. And now I don't have a job. So like, I still like making work, but it definitely feels weird. It's like, what is my purpose? Why am I doing this? So I think we let's pull it back for a second because we, we're speaking to a random dude who some people won't be aware of who, who you are, what your artwork is. Um, so let's give uh, some people a little bit of context. So I probably started following you I, I don't know, maybe January or February or something. And I literally only followed you because your handle was not the famous one on Twitter and you were called Adam Sandler. So I, I, I saw that you were called Adam Sandler and then suddenly you start posting all this cool stuff, this kind of cool orb stuff. So you, you kind of, the orb thing is, is yeah. your thing. Uh, kind of <laughs> gradient type work and... Um, and, and all this stuff that looks like 3D is actually being made in Illustrator. So you're not using 3D for any of this. So it, a lot of the stuff that you do has kind of got this kind of uncomfortable shadows and these uh, kind of trippy um, trippy gradients in it that you wouldn't be able to make in, in a 3D app because it would be too perfect. So you're, you're kind of, to an extent, if you were to imagine it, and we'll put some links to your stuff in this as well so people can check it out, if you were to imagine it, it's kind of imperfect 3D or human 3D, and it's it just looks really cool. So since I started following you, I think you you maybe I think you might have been about thousand followers or eight hundred followers or something when I started following you, and now a couple of months later, I'm looking at my screen now. You are at five eight six one followers, five thousand eight hundred sixty one. That seems to go up. That seems to go up by about a thousand every day or something at the minute when I'm looking. And I can see your top tweet that you pinned, the pinned tweet that you've got on there at the minute has got 500, 508 retweets, 4,000 likes, 54 replies. So that's some of the stuff that you've been doing on there. Um, and that's just a picture of four of your pieces. So pe people, there's not much else to it. It's just four of your pieces and it's just spread across the internet. So in terms of... Um, Twitter specifically, you are, as to what the cool kids say, blowing up right now. Yeah, I would say blowing up is, it's a good word. Relatively, probably not as much as some people in the small world of like art and design, maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm still not noticed by like a lot of the big names, like, you know, Mitch Goldstein, where you at? Where's my follow? I'm still waiting. Um, <laughs> I still want him to follow me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he replied to one of my tweets once, so that was cool. Um, you know, I think there's still work to be done. But yes, <laughs> I think uh, the trajectory of my Twitter is not was not expected, to say the least. Yeah, I, I think once you've got that ball rolling as well now, you're, you're at five, nearly 6,000 followers everything that you produce is just going to continue snowballing like that. So you'll be at 10,000, 20,000 soon. Um, and then that popularity will continue exploding. Have you lost the, the security, the financial security as well that came with that job? Um, yes, uh, for uh, the next four months anyway. Um, and, you know, things are very up in the air kind of with every, you know, everywhere. So like they said, they'll try to get me back as soon as possible. That'd be great. Um, I They have kind of a set date that they want to take me back in, but that's not until September. And who knows if they, like, what will ha be going on at that point. Um, you know, because originally they said nobody's going to, like, take any hit. But obviously things are changing. So do you, do you feel like 
there is uh, the the need for you to productize what was originally just a, an outlet for you in this situation to turn it into a product? Yeah, uh, definitely. Because, I mean, I was doing freelance a little bit before I like had this job, um, but it was kind of random. And like, I was doing mostly like decks for various companies, but then like this artwork you know, kind of became my thing. And then people were like interested in it. So I kind of was like, okay, well, how do I make this thing that I'm actually good at and I actually enjoy doing? How do I make money from it? You know, and that's usually the hard part, getting the money. Um, but luckily Twitter has been very good to me recently. And I've had a lot of people reach out about like album art and a few wow. small companies looking for like illustrations for, you know, their mac os apps that are like you know just need like an illustration or something i've had some cool opportunities but yeah i definitely feel like i have to productize my my uh brand now because i have no other source of income <laughs> yeah it's understandable yeah, and it puts that kind of weird pressure on it as well doesn't it where you, before you was kind of doing it for fun or, or yeah. exclusively for fun and now you've kind of under this pressure where you've got to think shit, I need to do something with this. I need to make some money from it. But you don't want to destroy what you were doing before. Right. And I mean, it's a little scary because I don't know, I feel like I'm like losing grip of uh, my style or like yeah. or like it's not the same. Um, I mean, to me, it doesn't seem the same to, to you. You might see like, oh, it's just another orb that Adam's doing and that looks cool also. <laughs> but to me, I'm like, uh, like I'm kind of losing it. Like, am I, am I handling this right? Am I uh structured like do i have a grip on my style still or am i going to lose it because i have to like force myself to do it almost i think it's that thing when um i kind of had this as well when i, I was working a crappy design job and i was trying to find an outlet to do something where I, because i didn't enjoy my job particularly i enjoyed doing some of the design work but the majority of it was like what you said it was you know t telling clients how to open pdfs and making dull work so I had an outlet as well, kind of a creative outlet, and I were making posters every day, kind of on whatever topic that I wanted to. But then all of a sudden when I moved into design jobs that I started enjoying, and I exclusively enjoyed my job all the time, eight hours a day, suddenly you lose the kind of impetus to do the fun stuff that kind of, you know, kind of dictates you as a designer and steers you and improves you and makes you better and things like that it's a, it's a really weird kind of struggling artist syndrome that you've got to try and keep going with my, my experience is more uh the more stable um being freelance the the more stable income i have for say a couple of months and even if it's it's corporate work um, the quality of my personal work increases because I feel happier in a safer place, even if it's just I know that there is no stability in this world. But um, if you've taken a bit of cash in up front, you know, you've got that work for a couple of months. Um, and as long as I've got time to do that work, that, that actually there is a like a synergy between the two that I feel happier in the financial situation. So the creative work also uh, turns out better. There's time for exploration. I don't feel it's a bigger risk spending money on printing stuff because I know that um, the client money will pay for it, that kind of thing. Um, rather than the security of that diminishing the creative output because uh, it, it takes over or, or drains me of energy. Hmm. Yeah. I feel, I, I feel that I, I, I definitely, I, there's like definitely that duality of like creative, like it's almost like the left brain, right brain thing, which I don't even know if it's real or whatever, but it's like, you know, my corporate brain over here is doing like, you know, PDFs and InDesign documents. I hate InDesign by the way. And then like the other half of me is like trying to escape and do like this creative outlet. So yeah, it's definitely like a struggle, especially when you lose that one half and the stability and it's like, well, now I kind of have to turn like this part into like my corporate brain almost and like make it a business. But you know, does that take away from the fun? I don't know. We'll see in a few weeks. <laughs> and, and there's quite a, that, that need and almost the, the speed of productization is a problem because you start applying um, pre-established systems of productizing stuff rather than being creative 
in the way you distribute and market your products. You go to Instagram and you see, okay, this is how people productize their content. And I will do that because I need to do it quickly. And then you just like, oh, you have a, a really interesting body of work now. Um, what would be a shame would be to, um, I think the album covers and these things are more interesting than wallpapers because in a way the wallpaper and the, the desktop screens are a bit of a low hanging fruit and almost saturate your work and diminish it because it's free um that people just become desensitized to it because it's on their phone it's on their computer screen rather than you holding it closer to yourself and trying to think about um what's the best channels of of sort of using this um and it seems that that's kind of where you are at the moment is trying to work out what is it who is it for and how do i get sort of compensated for that um creativity yeah well i would say i almost kind of disagree with what you just said um about how my work like how the wallpapers are kind of like devaluing my work almost um i kind of see it almost as a trade-off because when i design these it's like okay i'm gonna make some whack looking art that's like a math textbook cover or it looks like tame and would use it as a poster and that's like coming from the heart and like i enjoy doing it and then like those usually do well, like on Twitter. And then I put like two or three of them together as like wallpaper size. And then those like blow up like 90% of the time. So it's almost like a marketing tool for myself just to get more people to me. Um, because like, you know, it's accessible. So more people will see it and more people are like, wow, thanks. And I love seeing people having my work as their phone wallpaper. Like that's super cool. Uh, maybe there's like a way in the future where I can kind of like premium eyes, my, my work, maybe make special color editions that are only available like as posters. Um, but yeah, like I really like making them. I, I actually have more trouble doing like album art and stuff because as soon as there's somebody else who's kind of in the backseat, like in terms of creative directing, I'm like, uh, and that's why I, I charge people more if they, <laughs> if they want to, uh, like creative direct it. Like it doesn't cost as much if they're just like, here's my music. Here's like a color palette that I'm sort of feeling like do whatever, you know, I mean, if you do that, like it's probably going to be better anyway. <laughs> what, what about sort of concept though, that are you adjusting the style to meet a particular abstract concept that the album might have, or are you just applying your style and you in sort of infusing color palette into it. So the album artwork is there to just seduce people into sort of taking interest rather than it articulating or expressing some kind of uh, deeper. Right. Um, so usually people will come to the table with some ideas of like, you know, here, here's kind of what the music is about. Here's kind of how I perceive it. And, you know, music conveys like a mood. So it's kind of easy to work from. Uh, I feel like when I make album art, for people that they um like oh man i totally just lost my train of thought give me like three seconds and i'll figure out what i was talking about of course. um yeah so somebody comes to me they they have like a concept and usually they come to me because they have a concept and they also like my style and they want to see their concept in my style um most of the time it's not, I, I wouldn't go to like McDonald's for like a Wendy's burger, you know, like you come to me because of what I make. Um, and so they like my style and, and the idea of seeing their work as a one-off, like a special work in my style really excites them and it excites me too. So that's kind of why I like, that's usually how it goes when I create album art. They want, what I make, not what somebody else makes. So yeah. is there anything um, like a, uh, an aspirational context for your work to appear in, in the future is, is album artwork that kind of thing that you always wanted, or is there something even bigger where, you know, you have things like we transfer when you go onto their sort of uploading files, you, you have the artworks behind those or a billboard or the bottom of a plane. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the bigger the better. Um, it's sort of like an ongoing joke, but it's not really a joke. Um, I would love it 
if Tame Impala hired me to make a poster or art for them because I don't know. I just feel like my style works with them. And like, I will, I will post an art on Twitter and it gets far enough away from me, like retweeted and people have no idea what I'm about. And they'll be like, wow, Tame Impala should use this. Or like they, they either say that or like, this looks like my ninth grade calculus textbook. And like, that's, those are the highest forms of compliments that you could give me, even though they're two very different things, but like, that's what I'm going for. Like, I would love for my work to be on a textbook, which is so stupid. Cause like nobody wants no, to I think that's sweet. <laughs> right. So like a textbook or like Tame Impala posters, but also like, you know, a billboard would be really cool. Uh, I mean, the company I works for, um, they actually owned like a lot of advertising space around the country. Um, and they were doing a whole project with, um, you know, it was about kind of words of encouragement um, during like COVID-19 related stuff. So they actually used one of my posters, like flatten the curve. Uh, I made one that was like, you know, in my style and they put it on a billboard somewhere. I didn't see it, but it's out there. I think um, I'll, I'll see if I can find it, but um, yeah, the bigger, the better. I'm all, I'm all for, I'm, I'm trying to reel in someone big. So if you know anybody, I think that's that's where the going back to the channels of distribution, the wallpaper um, on phones and mobiles is that it becomes uh, a conversation and that people are having a conversation outside of you and not including you. And the bigger that is, the more chance. And if they're tagging, taming all of these different things that right. they're going to see it eventually, right? Where it's like we can't ignore this anymore or, or then right. manager, social media managers like, okay, look, it's blowing up. We need some of this. Right. I've, ha I've had, okay. I've had like two possibilities of some, someone of Kevin seeing my work of, of Tame Impala. So this one guy fo followed me and Tame Impala follows him. Barack Obama also follows this guy, which I think is very interesting, but that guy follows me. I don't remember his name and I'm very sorry if you're watching this, but, um, I don't know what you do, what your relations with Tame and follow, but please. Um, and then the other guy was somebody who follows me and he wanted a special poster for me. He was like in a really interesting country that I had never heard of. I think it's Andorra, which is apparently between uh, Spain and France. I thought you were going to say I, England then. Yeah, <laughs> no. Um, and, and he was like, he was like, thanks so much for helping me. He's like, by the way, I'm going to, send my tweets to my sister um we're originally from perth and and she'll see if she can get it in front of tame and paula's face and i was like sick so that's that's where i'm currently at um yeah, somebody's think, gonna see it i think it's so a, i'm just gonna it's only a matter yeah. of time i think yeah yeah i'm just making enough noise until somebody sees it so how how do you see um are you playing with a, a degree of uh uh, nostalgia that there's this sort of uh, cultural uh, feeling at the moment where um, the past is actually a very controlled situation we know how uh, what 1990 to 2000 looked like um, it's not going to change um, it's always going to be as we remembered it and this is really important in a time where we don't know what the future looks like that we go back and you're riding a very uh, powerful nostalgic sentiment at the moment. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I hadn't really considered that because I mean, my style to me is reminiscent of, you know, aesthetic choices, aesthetic styles that I enjoy. Like I love like eighties styles, like film and design and advertising, uh, like early nineties stuff is fun too. And so, I mean, since like January, I've really been designing posters that like have that feel. And I don't know, I've always just been into that, but I, I, maybe it's blowing up right now because people are like, I'm freaking out. I would love to see a dumb math textbook cover from the nineties right now. And then I'm like, yes, I can do that for you. I think there's um, a little, a little bit of that with everything at the minute, isn't it? It's why Nintendo switches are sold out everywhere. It's why animal crossing you can't find anywhere because we're all trying to find this little bit of escapism from this, crazy lockdown situation we all currently find ourselves in um and yeah I, th I think there's probably something in it like you said there that people are just looking for something to enjoy and when you look at your work you can never just not enjoy it because it's just fun it's it's nice to look at bright colors 
it's just you can get lost in it and i think everybody's looking for a little bit of that at the minute to try and get lost in things that kind of disconnect them from what they're currently experiencing yeah totally i i mean that's i mean i have a nintendo switch i'm very grateful that i've had one because as soon as <laughs> animal crossing came out and all this was going on my girlfriend was like i need a nintendo switch and it took us a very long time to find one yeah so people are really trying to call back on their on their past and find find a little bit of escapism and i think my work does a good job of providing this like weird reality that like doesn't exist anywhere except my head and like i'll post something like a line and i'll be like you guys seeing what i'm seeing everyone everyone's <laughs> like what are you talking about it's a line and then like i will post like the art next to it like the final work with like literally a line and people are like Push. so you know people like that that a little escapism the randomness that i provide also i think i'm kind of goofy so like people enjoy just seeing me be an idiot on the internet it's kind of fun yeah yeah i think they do but that's not the only thing i, I want to talk about because the whole point of this episode is creative process and the whole point of that's the job is that me and me and rich usually give kind of like a a british reality to 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 design so you've kind of you've you've got this dichotomy between your work that we've just been talking about that you've got this crazy stuff that you that you put online that isn't it's art it's not particularly design although you know we could have that conversation whatever yeah, yeah. Well, and, sure let's and, call it art and then you're also a designer so you are a i guess you say a corporate designer too yeah um I mean, my, I studied for graphic design for four years at college, you know, I went through all the basic principles of design and art and art theory. And I took history of design. I love, I love that stuff. Um, yeah, my background is very traditional. I thought when I graduated, I was like going to work at like a design studio. I wanted to work at like Fuzzco or like Red Antler or like one of those, you know, crazy, like beautifully uh creating uh studios or i wanted to be like a product designer or a brand designer like headspace or casper or spotify or apple or whatever like i was like that's that's what i want to do and i mean would i still do those probably yes um but i mean things i've gone off on a little bit of a of a a curve from that um but yeah so that's currently where i'm at so, so where did the the orb stuff start coming in is that from very early on? So I think it was like senior year of college. I was like, I, I was just kind of like experimenting with Illustrator and I sort of created, like found like gradient mesh tools and like, I was just kind of messing around and like every little bit I would like make a weird world. Um, but they were very sloppy in comparison to what I'm making now. Um, usually pretty flat. Um, but they, they were weird. They usually incorporated more text, um, a little, I would usually play with Photoshop too. A few of them use cinema 4d. I was really into like, uh, Bowgasm on Instagram. Vastian Catro is his name. Um, and like Anthony to disco, who's like a beautiful, like 3d, uh, cinema 4d designer. And I was like trying to mimic their styles. Um, and so I kind of did that for like a few years. And I think between like, like all 2019, I made like three art things the whole time. I was just, I was stressed because I was like in between like moving and finding jobs and becoming a freelancer before my first real job and leaving school. And then, you know, like my work, I was always like constantly refining it, but it always kind of looked the same. And then it wasn't until like January that it, that I really started designing works that felt more complete. Um, and it really started because of that whole textbook thing, which was like a joke. It literally started as a joke. One of my really good friends, or I would say my best friend, he, he messages me. He's like, you know, your art kind of just looks like bath textbook covers. And he sent me like a screenshot of like three that, that were next to each other. And I was like, yeah, you're kind of right. And I hadn't really considered it, but that like really nailed uh nailed my work uh and i was like all right well i'll just like try to make one you know it's like a joke and you know and then they just 
kept getting more convoluted and I was trying to use more tools and I like I was using a lot of references and they were getting like really refined and eventually it just became like a body of work and I was like I better like alter my entire website right now from like my brand design and my web design stuff because like people are going to see that work and then they're going to want to see more of my work and if this is not on my website it's like people are going to be like oh whatever so I like revamped my whole identity basically around this uh this artwork and you know like orbs became like a weird like centerpiece of my projects because I think they're really fun to play with and you can like do weird things with light and like refracting light and creating fake shadows that are just like you know they don't look real they look real ish but I think that's kind of the appeal so I just kind of stuck with it and that's kind of where I am now did that answer the question <laughs> yeah yeah De- yeah definitely I, th- I think you've also got that that constraint in your work as well that just massively helps in in design you've got the orb thing basically so on on your pieces that there's always an orb or there's there's an orb traveling through it and you've always got this energy through the pieces and it it helps you keep keep to the style but kind of riff around it as well and improve it and change it and i always think that kind of attitude to stuff it makes you way more creative on a particular project yeah i try to be restrained i don't like i mean honestly i'm not like an amazing artist like fine artist you know i did some oil paintings here and there and like i think they're okay but you know if someone told me like draw a person i'd be like please god like no like i i can't really do that and that's why i kind of stick to like you know simple weird shapes like it's a circle you know there's a tool for it you're not going to mess up a circle if it's if it exists in the in the illustrator palette and that's why i do like things with cubes sometimes and then i just like use the pen tool and i make random shapes that way like you can't tell me my squiggle is wrong because it doesn't have to look like anything (laughs) yeah yeah that's that's the way to look at it just keep making it more and more abstract so then it can be anything and and no one can tell you it's wrong you know people are like is that a pomegranate seed and i'm like do you want it to be a pomegranate seed like sure that's it's cool with me like um, it's whatever you want it to be so so in terms of kind of creative process i look at your stuff now and it's amazing and i'm thinking i don't see how that could get any better in you know in terms of me looking at it what what are you kind of doing now to advance your creative process or change it are you trying to get faster and make more or slower and make less or well okay those like four that i that are like my pin tweet I feel like are the best ones I've ever made. And I look at those two and I'm like, how am I going to do better than that? You know? Um, And honestly, I mean, this, this all is just like random, you know, I sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm going to make a poster. And I like sit there and my mind is blank a lot of the times. And I'm just like, okay, maybe I'll just draw like a, like a horizon and maybe like a circle. And then I just kind of like see what happens. But those ones that I created, like I did not have, like I have no direction. So I feel like whether it's going to be a hit or a miss is really just dependent on if my brain feels like making a hit or a miss in that day. So, I mean, this is probably bad advice for for whoever's listening to this and like establishing a solid creative process. But I mean, I guess the one consistent thing I'm doing is I'm just making work and then I share it. I always share it. Like, even if I'm like, this is not the best thing I've ever made. um, I'm still learning from it and other people probably can too. And sometimes people get inspired to make their own work. Um, Someone like just before this tweeted at me and they're like, been so inspired with your work. And then they, they make something similar, which I think is like really cool to see that I'm inspiring other people to make work that they normally wouldn't. So I think that's really important is this um, open process uh, where it's an invitation for people to see um, a very, uh, a person that is vulnerable and knows that um, not every piece is as good as they want it to be. And you're saying to other people, look, it's actually doing is better than just thinking about doing. And by sharing it, you create a kind of uh, agency. Uh, Whereas, the other side is this mythologizing of process where uh, someone posts this perfect case study online and it looks like magic. And 
uh, that's very frightening for a young designer to see where they see something uh, that to them seems perfect. Um, I, I would love to see more in terms of process from uh, these very uh, large characters in design rather than them saying, here's this perfect bound book. Uh, yeah, that's like, that's terrifying to me. I mean, still, because like when I was in school and even now I look at like UI, UX, product design portfolios and I'm like, this is like, this is beyond anything I could ever create. And it's like, it like kills me inside. I'm like, I can't do this. And then it makes me feel sad. I'm like, I'm, I'm never going to be a product designer. Cause I, I, I don't know how to like, I, like, I don't know how to align type like that. Or, you know, I don't, how do they get the spacing perfect every time? But I'm sure there's so much behind the scenes that we're not seeing. So that's, that's probably like, you know, if they brought it to light, it would make me feel a little better. And that's why I feel like I don't feel uncomfortable sharing my work that I'm like, this is okay. Like, or this is literally, this is a circle and then like a horizon and shadow, you know, the rest is just kind of like, you know, playing with it. And I share those failures or, you know, some people consider them successes because they're like, wow, that's something cool. And I'm like, you can do it too. You know, I don't, I don't want people to be afraid to create art. And how involved are you um, when you see other people's work? If you see a young designer or an illustrator and um, perhaps they're not quite there yet, are you very engaged in helping other people and saying, because I, I find it very difficult to, I get a lot of people from Logo Archive asking me, what do you think of this logo? What do you think of this logo? And it's hard for me to, I don't know how to frame that conversation uh, in my mind, I'm thinking there's there's no design craft here, there's no idea here, but I don't know how to talk to young designers. Are you quite good with, with uh, talking to um, designers and helping them? Yeah, well, I feel like in, in school, um, I, I felt like I was always a presence that people could come to if they wanted to talk about their design and, like, get feedback. And, you know, if somebody... I mean, I really haven't had people who have like messaged me and been like, can you look at my work? Uh, can you tell me what you think? Um, obviously, you kind of have to uh, do a little bit of research first to understand who you're talking to before you're like, this is bad. I mean, I would never say that anyway. But I mean, I think it's always good to go in and and kind of ask some questions before you can even give a response. You know, who are you designing this for? Or like, like what inspired you to make this and then you can kind of frame your response around the answers they give to those questions and say like i think this does a really good job of conveying uh the mood you're going for like it feels very dark i i, I feel like I, I feel alone when i look at this art or like it makes me feel a certain way um rather than giving them constructive advice but that's kind of hard when you're a designer and you ask specifically for constructive advice. And if you do that, then I guess you just give it to them. If they say, well, what do you think of this logo? You can be like, well, the line weight feels a little weird. Or, you know, it, I think it's easy to frame criticism without shattering a person's heart. And I try to do that whenever possible because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but I don't want to lie to people also. This is definitely, as, as Craig mentioned, you are to some degree blowing up on, on in, uh, Twitter. <laughs> uh, but the, the com there's a responsibility we, that comes with that kind of thing that people start to see you as a, um, an authority, I suppose, um, that they, they would like um, uh, to, to engage with someone with that kind of profile or that visibility. Um, how are you sort of managing that visibility where you didn't have it before and now before you were posting things and you were saying you weren't a hundred percent happy, but you would have like 800 people. Now you have nearly 6,000. It's a very visible uh, process. Yeah. Um, I, th I think it is weird. I'm still like trying to get used to people who are like messaging me. Like, I mean, I get a lot more messages than I did before. You know, I get a lot more likes and, like interaction on my tweets um it is it's weird I, I mean i'm still trying to navigate that world um like it's, it's i feel i feel a panic attack coming thinking about the idea of like 
of all of these people following me and seeing me as an authority figure. Cause to me, I'm just like a dude who's like currently in Maine uh, because I'm like relocated because of the coronavirus. You know, I'm hanging out with my girlfriend and her family. We go on walks around the local summer camp uh, along the lake with her dog. And, you know, I really like playing video games. Like to me, I'm still not like a figure that people should feel like, like, I feel like my word should not be above anyone else's. I'm just making art. Um, and if you like my art, great, follow me. But I feel like every, everyone's should take whatever I say with a grain of salt. Usually I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm not a joke on the internet, but like I am very lighthearted. I don't want to, uh, I, I try not to like fight people about like, you know, the newest redesigns and stuff. Um, Cause that's a big thing on design Twitter. What's up design Twitter. Please don't poach me. Uh, now. So, I mean, I'm still getting used to it. Um, obviously you have to watch what you say, regardless of who's listening. Um, I, I think I've always been good at that. I've been on the internet since like, uh, you know, AIM was a thing. Uh, you know, I had like a Tumblr growing up. That's where like I learned to code and I had like, I actually had like 20,000 followers on Tumblr, but I've like totally nuked that account. And I was like 13, 14 posting like photography. Uh, but obviously the things I was saying back then was like not as interesting as what I currently am talking about. But I'm still trying to work through like the internet and how to handle my fame, if you want to call it that. It's, it's just that weird thing. That me and Rich spoke about it on one of the other episodes where they just... Once they see that number, you, you've kind of got that weird thing where you are now famous, you're an authority, now everything you you say must have value or credence because there's a big number next to your name. But often the big number next to the name is just because you've been consistent with posting quality content. It doesn't often really, really make you any more special than anybody else unless, you know, unless you are like already super famous like Kanye West or something like that or The Rock. But um it's it's kind of that weird weird dichotomy of of fame and i th- i think you i think you're handling it the right the right way on twitter I, I still think that something that they were talking about on twitter for a while ago was getting rid of the follower numbers i still think that's a good idea just completely get rid of people's follower numbers and you don't even know how many followers people have got anymore so i mean social media for me kind of creates like some level of anxiety um you know i feel like i've always been like cognizant of my followers and interaction with my posts like more so than a normal person should but i'm a product of the 21st century and i'm a millennial so this is how i live my life and it's very hard um but (laughs) but um yeah i i feel like to some degree it'd be good Um, because then, you know, everyone's on a level playing field, but at the same time, it's like, it's almost like if you have more followers, then I guess you're worth, worth following, you know, now that's kind of how I see myself now that I have more followers. Well, I guess I'm worth following and you should follow me because I have all the followers I have, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's a weird situation. But my feeling is that this follower number is, uh, it's, um, it's used as a, a, a credibility thing that it becomes sticky. Um, and the more you have, the more people feel like they should be involved in what you're doing. And um, I would be disappointed if they pulled the numbers from my Instagram profile, because I feel that's the thing that um, when people see that, that they feel like that, that it's credible, right? Um, I've started a number of things from scratch again more recently and it's really scary starting from zero followers with something new, having built something quite big like Logo Archive or bp and um, And that you realize that it, it is an uphill battle without that kind of backing or um, perception of credibility. Yeah. yeah. Even if I disagree with it, right, that I don't believe that it's any... Uh, reflection of credibility i've seen people with like 50 followers and their work is really really thoughtful there's a lot of design craft there and it's just that they don't really want to get involved in that kind of 
social capital kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's like a dichotomy, right? You you need the followers. You don't believe that you need the followers, whatever. Yeah, I, I think to some level as well, our, our egos enjoy it too. We'd be lying if we didn't say that it's nice to have our work recognized and uh, it's nice to see that number and you think, oh, I'm actually providing value and I'm um, doing something good that's getting recognized. Yeah, no, I... I mean, I was even, I, cause Instagram was where I posted my work for the most part for like the last, you know, I've had an Instagram for a while since kind of it was like created and people were posting like those, those terrible filters on top of their pictures of like their dog or whatever, or whatever they were doing. Like Instagram was so weird back then. Kind of was like the wild west. And that was like where I posted my work up until like, I mean, probably I, I post but not nowhere near as much. And my interaction, it was like, I never got over like 1500 followers. You know, I was like trying so hard to like become recognized, but I couldn't figure out how I was like, I don't think my work is that bad, you know? And like people who interact with it say it's good. So like, like, I feel like, like it feels bad to not be recognized for the work I'm doing for the work I, for the like, value i think i'm providing and then i like i was ranting to a friend and i was like i'm so sad like nobody sees my work and like i'm bad at i'm a bad designer like that's kind of what social media has done to me or like to a lot of people they're like i'm bad because i don't have a lot of followers and i mean that's not the case but that's kind of how i feel and then of course i blow up on twitter i'm like now i'm a good designer um (laughs) But, but it, it's definitely better than what it was, which is the kind of institutionalized publishing channels where the magazine editor was the filter at which you had to pass in order to reach their readership. Now, the although an algorithm is an invisible force, um, there are uh, visible um, ways of engaging with that in order to help grow an audience. And I don't know whether you said 15,000 or 1,500, but um, that's a lot more than you would have had pre-Instagram when the channels of uh, design and art distribution was um, material. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I can't really speak to that world because when I got out of school, social media was prominent. Um, But yeah, it's, it's a real thing, that algorithm. It, so, something changed honestly within the last you know three or four years that made it like just really hard for capital it's, yeah it's, it's always capital um, right so i mean i'm not paying money to promote my work on social media uh, i think that's stupid but um i i think that that's essentially what what uh what happened is that um, a lot of smaller creators began to build uh, an audience and they saw the potential of, say, uh, drawing a bit of micro promotional capital from that. Um, rather than being supported by big corporations, they thought, and, and this is the sort of friction that I have with it, is um, I make very little money from an Instagram profile of 157,000 followers. Um, and I'm being asked to sort of give money in order to reach, I, I basically reach like 13% of that. And it's frustrating. And I spend so much time building that. But it's understandable. We, we live in this free market economy. Um, that That is what it takes to sustain that platform. And um, it, it, it's up to me to try and find a way to to, to make the most of that. And not have it shape my behavior or my my work. I, th- I think it, it, it's a, a point that you made there, Rich. That's that's really important as well. That it is, it's powerful as well now that we we're not beholden to editors and magazines and things like that. And we've got the potential to to reach and build our own audience with very simple tools that are free, even if uh, we don't always get to reach them. But Adam, you you've now got an audience of. 6,000 people on, on Twitter that you didn't have before and that kind of audience 10 years ago would have been impossible to build without magazines and uh, and outside editors and outside forces so I think that is the real magic and power of the internet right now that you've got the, the ability to if 
if you're making anything cool to put it on the internet and you've got exactly the same level playing field as everybody else to build an audience well it, it's it's not level right because some people are actually paying <laughs> well yeah you know what i mean okay so i um, We've we've spoke a bit about creative prog uh, the put my teeth back in creative process. Um, I I just want to return to you as a designer, um, Adam, and how do, how do how do you see that now? Do, do you still want to? I know you mentioned you still maybe it'd be cool to work at Spotify or stuff like that. But do you do you still kind of see yourself developing both sides of? Do you want to be an artist or do you want to be a designer or do you kind of? Not sure where that's going to go. Yeah, that's a that's a tough intersection. Like I say, like I I feel like I don't I feel like I don't have to choose. So I you know like especially now because I mean the only it's funny I posted one of my works one time on the graphic design subreddit and it was taken down and I was like why is it taken down and he's like because there's no text on it. And I was like, so that makes a graphic design. So if I throw this back up with text on it, now it's graphic design. So like, you know, I'm an artist. And as soon as I put on that title <laughs> on it somewhere, then it becomes graphic design. Um, no, but like, I think being graphic designer is kind of taking, you know, art or whatever, and then, you know, styling it a little more. Um, so like, I think when I create a poster, whatever, that's art. But if I do anything else with it, it's sort of graphic design, you know, what if I actually mocked it up on a textbook and I like added like text and like a barcode or something funny or like a publisher, you know, is that graphic design? Maybe. Um, but I don't think I have to choose between one or the other, but I would still love to, you know, work on brands and, you know, develop identities for other companies as much as I like doing, you know, art. I, yeah, I think that's that's the power of design as well. Once you're a designer, you can apply it to so many other areas. It's not kind of an ex- exclusive skill as such that you that you need to do. Have you kind of ever had any kind of art projects or anything, Rich? You ever done anything like um, what Adam does? So I, I feel like I am engaged in some form of art practice across all of the things I do. So BPNO seems like that it's about um, the individual projects I write about, but actually it's an expression of my own liberal worldview. That what I'm looking at is not just the individual posts, but the relationship between different posts. So you can understand something about my worldview if you read from the original post in 2011 to the latest post that I am expressing something of myself in that. And the same goes for the Logo Archive project by having the zine, although I'm sharing um, like a historical portion that there's always a a written component in which I'm sharing a particular worldview or I'm proposing a worldview. So although it's not in in a sense uh, an obvious expression of art, it very much is. And that's kind of how I see all of my activities is that I'm sharing a point of view with people and I'm asking them what do you think and would you like to respond to that and uh, that kind of thing it's just wrapped up within the frame of what people might understand as, as graphic design. Mm, I think you're, you're also working across different mediums as well I think there's a lot a lot of you know you, you work in words on BPNO and in, in logo archive there's kind of the collation thing and the research thing as well as the zine thing and I, I think there's a lot of power as a for a designer to learn more about other things about design by actually applying those skills across different kind of mediums that sometimes we don't always explore. Yeah. And I think typology can be quite a restrictive thing that if you have to apply a name to something or to your practice, um, that is ideal in terms of um, client services that people want to know in uh, layman's terms, what it is that you provide and uh, using terms like graphic design, graphic artist are useful as a way to sell um, your services, but it's not something you want to use to define um, who you are and then what it, what it is you want to achieve and how you go about expressing that particular sort of point of view. Um, I only try to, to use, I only use graphic design or corporate identity design as a way to sell services. It's, it doesn't define who I am. With the the logo archive stuff, do you kind of approach it as a 
a daily project or a weekly project or anything? How, do you know what I mean? Do you set a time, set aside some time every day to work on that? Or how do you see no, that? No, um, I'm quite different in that I see a lot of people and they use all of these uh, management software and they have like a very clear process and um, daily routine. I'm hugely instinctual. Uh, it's now I want to do this. Now I want to do that. It, it's like, I never know what I'm going to do the next day. It's just whatever I feel like doing. If I have a client deadline, of course, you've, you've, you've got to focus on, on doing that. But um, sometimes I can get lost three or four hours trying to correct a, a mistake that I made on BP and O in, in the code. And I don't know what to do with it. And I feel really bad about that, you know, losing four hours, but um, it's just instinct. I do whatever I feel like doing next, uh, unless I have to do something. Okay. I, I think that's, that's what actually one of the reasons why I, I wanted to speak to Adam and particularly why I, I zoomed him last week, because you've got the, the 180 second art thing, which we mentioned yeah. briefly at the beginning, where you kind of do them every day or every couple of days and you kind of do that to warm up and things. And that's, that's uh, often how I see things as well. I, I have a little, little bit of a, a project or something I do every day to kind of warm up creatively, kind of something that's got specific restraints or whatever. And it's been various things throughout my career. Um, and I think it's a really interesting way to, to improve and to kind of explore things to just sit there it's particularly 180 seconds as well jesus you just go right i'm going to set a timer for 180 seconds and i'm going to see what's what's going to happen in in that it's just a crazy a crazy restraint yeah i uh i don't know why we started with the with the time restraint it was something my coworker and i like started doing we we're like like just wanted to do some sort of warm-up like what if we had like some sort of like art theme like you know, that we work from every day or in the morning. And I'm like, well, like we have a lot of work to do already. Like that could take like an hour. And like, I don't, I don't, I, I can't, I can't take an hour to do some fun personal thing. Like I would love to, but like we have other stuff to do. I was like, well, what if we just like only gave ourselves three minutes to make an artwork, you know, like what can we do? And he was like, I don't know. And so then we just started doing it. And uh, yeah, I guess, I guess kind of caught on. <laughs> You know what I'm going to ask you next, don't you? I, I do. I definitely didn't know this was happening. Or anything. <laughs> Would you like me to share my screen? Yeah, do it. Okay. Yeah, I had no idea this was happening. This is crazy. Uh, oh, I'm, what's that? I'm just oh, that's trying. interesting. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Give me two seconds. Let me just make sure I'm recording this in a different way as well. Right. Do you have a timer or here? I, I wonder if I can, um, I usually just do it on my phone, but I wonder if there's a, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to figure that out right now, but, um, I'm just going to pull it up on my phone and then kind of go from there. But yeah, you tell me whenever and I'll do whatever. All right. So I've got it. My screen is recording. So awesome. I'm ready whenever you are. Okay, this is an incredible amount of pressure. I'm going to give you a little uh, forewarning. Um, just kind of talking about like what's about to happen. So usually I just set the timer and I do my thing. Obviously, you're both here and like there's going to be an audience. Um, so I'm not sure this is going to play out so well, but we're going to see what happens. Uh, also, I'm probably not going to talk at the beginning because I'm trying to establish some sort of like, like, concepts but once i start getting into it i'm probably going to do a lot of nervous talking um you can ask me questions if i respond or not it's uh who knows i gotta take a drink of water this is very intensive Warm up. all right let's do it i also usually listen to music when i do this i'm not going to obviously for our sake but usually I listen to like really depressing music um i like joji you should look him up, by the way. He's super cool. Um, I, I listen to uh, drum and bass. I find that the, the speed of it makes me work much, much faster. Oh, yeah. No, that is not me. I, I'd, I'm, like, not really into that. I, I'm, like, if this makes me cry, like, oh. But it's not, like, traditional, like, like classical ballad kind of crying. It's, like, depression alt 
tears. I don't know. It's it's very weird. Just look up Joji sometime. He's great. J O J I. Okay. And that you're drawing is it a teardrop in every one of your pieces? What did you say? Is it not an orb that you're drawing in all your pieces? Is it, is it a teardrop that you draw in every time? Yeah, exactly. It's a teardrop. It's instinctive. Um, okay. I haven't really thought about this. So I'm going to count down from three and then just, just get it going. Uh, I don't know what that was. Oh, let me also make sure. I'm going to hide you because that would be – don't want that in my way. Uh, and I need to make sure because sometimes it gets set to grayscale. I don't know. Illustrator's whack. All right. Let's go. In three, two, oh, my chapstick's rolling around. Three, two, one. Oh man, my hands are really shaking around. This is wild. <laughs> Super crazy. I was really blown away when I first saw this. I'd played around with gradient meshes as well, but I didn't realize you could do this kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I don't know how I actually just uh, made that whole um, grid turn on in the background, and it's really tripping me uh, tripping me up right now. So if you have any idea what that is or what's happening, I would very much appreciate any uh, advice on how to get rid of it. But that's okay. I'm just going to work from it. Um, all right, so kind of we have some sort of like – guide here that I can follow. Um, no, that's not what I wanted. Um, yeah, this is, this is kind of weird, um, but you know, they all kind of are. Um, and so I kind of just try to create meshes and I push and I pull and I try to, uh, see like that was an accident, but fuck it. We're going to leave it. That shit looks great. Um, and then no, not there. Something there. Oh yeah. Do you ever use the blend tool to blend shapes? So smooth transitions rather than stuff? Oh, no, never. I'm sure that would be a great idea if I did it, but I don't. Um, yeah, this one is not looking like what I normally do, which is great, you know? It's good to be um, agile and multifaceted right um you know this could use like a little bit of a backdrop type thing uh, yeah, this is a uh, this is interesting to say the least um oh sometimes no i'm not not gonna share that not gonna share that uh method that's a little too hardcore don't want to do that right now it could really trip me up um and this is all still mathematics, right? This can scale up to a hundred meters if you want. Yeah, to. this is this is just Illustrator, being an Illustrator. So like, um, yeah, there's really no. Uh, Have you ever found the computers slow down? Is is this ever? Oh, like uh, intensive on my machine kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, it really hasn't. But other people like contacted me. They're like, I tried doing this and it like broke my computer. And I'm like, well, that's unfortunate. I can't help you there. Um, yeah, and you know, sometimes I'll like add like a little shadow. Um, and I, I do this all on one layer, which probably is not, uh, you know, the best idea, but you know, whatever. I, I really don't abide by the rules. All right, there we go. We're done. Um, so that's three minutes. It's an artwork. It looks a, like this. It's got a um, celestial quality. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, this is my brain today, whatever is happening here. Um, Usually what I do now is I'll export it to Photoshop and I'll just add like noise to it just to give it like that textural quality. But so if you write, that's the job across the top, it's graphic design. <laughs> yeah. Here, use this for your, your cover, you know, Oh God. The... That's the job. Oh, you know it. <laughs> it's Truck extended. Yeah, it's a great font. Um, Do you ever now take these ideas and use them on other things, or is it quite every once in a while? I have done that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's like a specific one that I didn't call out. Um, not not to my knowledge, but yeah, like usually sometimes I like use like a, like this is kind of fun. Like I like this shape a lot, so maybe I can use that for uh, the piece. Um, 
Yeah, this I'm trying to see if there's anything crazy that I've done that's been from a yeah, oh, okay, wow. here. You want to see my creative process? It's this thing. <laughs> and then here, like that's what my files look like. And then I have my math in in the uh, corner. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of what I do, and that's my process. Um, and that's the job, I guess. It's quite amazing how even though um, the, the shading and the light and shadows subvert uh, real world um, physics, it still feels very physical in a sense. Yeah, I see like, I know it's like a lot of like random like colors and shapes and I, I can't say like it's all planned, but like I, tr I try to make it feel like there's some sort of foregrounds. Like if I had more time, I'd probably go in here and I'd like add like a shadow like that. And we're just going to leave it like that and say it's three minutes anyway, you know? Um, but like I try to create some sort of semblance of, you know, of reality, even though it's like obviously illustrator and very random and fake. I think you were also, as you were using the gradient mesh, because you know how that tool works very well. You, you, you're kind of doing things that you've just picked up and you've learned through practicing over and over. If I was to do the same, I wouldn't even know where to start with a gradient mesh tool. So I wouldn't even know what it needed to look like. And you were very instinctually putting orbs and circles in particular places as well. And I, I just go, I don't know where to start. I'd spend <laughs> three minutes trying to work out how to turn gradient tool on. Yeah. Um, it's a super great tool, a uh, gradient mesh right here. Um, I, I highly recommend, you know, you play around with it because it will just do crazy stuff to your work that you didn't even anticipate happening. Um, you know, like I like that too. So we're going to leave it. Mm. What do you think? Do you have a preference, this one or this one? I want the, the three minute one, you know, anything that happens yeah. after it's, it's, uh, it's yeah, more authentic here, here to go. the process. Here we go. It can be the that, start work for this uh, episode as well. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave the, uh, the, um, the title too, in case, in case you want to use this for whatever. Um, and then that, that will, uh, that was fun. I really enjoyed doing that. I'll be honest. It was like, my heart was racing and I felt like my mouse did not want to cooperate. So, um, I, I I'm glad I kept my cool there. <laughs> that, that thing you were just doing that reminded me of something I signed up for a couple of years ago. It was a, a challenge called code in the dark. Um, and there were basically five of us sat at computers and we had to um code up a website by the way I, i'm terrible at coding websites but i signed up to it um and you had to basically write all the markup for a website and you had i think it was 10 minutes or 15 minutes and you couldn't see the result of what you were making but everybody in front of you could uh and they had this, i don't like that at all yeah and they had this pumping synth wave music and you were just sat there in this in this loud nightclub crazy experience fun but <laughs> wow that's crazy huh yeah i wonder how i well it's a little different if it's like visual but I, I would love to see what my art would look like if i you know straight up wasn't looking at it um you know maybe that would be the next part of the series yeah 180 second art blind edition yeah i, th I think it's 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 a really cool really cool method to just do that and just kind of flush out anything that you're working on and then just move on to something else. And you might actually find some cool ideas that you can apply to other things. It's, it's really interesting. I'm definitely going to try it out in some way. No, that was fantastic. It was really amazing to see you uh, do that challenge. And it was really inspiring for me. I, I do give myself a, sometimes a set period of time, but I could do with doing something quicker like that. And the gradient mesh tool, I did use it for a client project, um, couple of weeks ago but i didn't really go very much further into it so i'm definitely going to give that a try a bit more um so thank you for showing that and inspiring me yeah also like it's only three minutes so you know it can kind of just be like random it doesn't have to be amazing it's probably not gonna be it's only three minutes like what can you really do in three minutes so you can just you know, make something random, be like, okay, that was fun, interesting, I learned something new, and then you go on with your day. You know, there's no, like, huge commitment because it's only 180 seconds, and you probably 
we're just going to use that time to do work anyway. And why do work when you can do just do something not work? And that's probably why I got fired. Um, <laughs> I think that's it's also really good for um, uh, people transitioning from uh, education to design practices that. Uh, design students when when they come in for internships they're uh, a little bit slower a little bit methodical and you want to loosen them up and say look we don't care about how it looks what we want is like 15 ideas on the page you've got a couple of hours to do it that's what we're hiring you for is this capacity for ideation uh, exactly. not, not your design craft we know you'll get that eventually yeah I had a few professors in college who really you know, applauded, like creativity, trying something new. Uh, it was more about the process than the result. Obviously, it's a little weird because when you're in school, you're like throughout the years, it's kind of expected that your work is going to become like it's the final that matters, like the final project. But some teachers like it was like, it's OK if the outcome isn't what you're expecting, because it's really about how you got there. And did you learn anything along the way? Like, is there are there tools, other processes you can use? that uh, in another project, even though you didn't end up in the, in the, um, with the result you wanted. So, you know, I think it's important just to design with, um, you know, with that in mind, it's okay to not be okay with how your, your projects end up. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's a good way to end it. Have you, uh, have you got anything you want to finish on? Do you want to plug anything? Do you want to say what your website is or your Twitter or anything? We'll um, yeah, sure. So I am Adam Sandler. I am not the famous one. Um, yes, Adam Sandler is my real name. It's not like a pseudonym or anything. That's literally, my parents don't hate me. Um, like it was not on purpose. Uh, he wasn't that famous. Um, I do have one question that somebody asked me uh, on my Twitter when I retweeted your thing. Um, should, should I answer that? Yeah. Sure. Uh, it's a really simple question and random. Uh, how, how do you get the beautiful palette of colors that you use? Um, and to that I say, just use whatever is the most saturated color and then combine it with more saturated colors. And that's, that's all there is to it. Contrast is good. So like I usually do something that's like blue and orange or blue and pink. Um, just really bright really obnoxious and then when you're done put it in photoshop and then mess with it even more and then you'll get yourself some nice saturated colors that will be beautiful that's all i got 